We are live and ready for you to start, Christy, whenever you're ready. Hey, thank you, Candace. Um, Jim, I'm going to turn it over to you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Charlotte Historic District Commission welcomes you to the June 10th virtual business meeting. I'm Jim Hayden, chairperson. Also sitting on today's commission are PJ Pennington, Chris Murren, Kim Parati, Jessica Heinemann, Michelle Bonaparte, Krista Leinberger, John Ferris, Jill Walker, Damon Rumps, James Jordan, and Chris Barr. Also, we have our staff today, Christy Harps, Cindy Kuchanik, Candy Leite, our Simpson City Attorney, Andrea Leslie Fight, and Linda Keach, the clerk to the board. Because the commission is a quasi-judicial body, no public hearings will be held during today's virtual meeting. Today's meeting will be moderated by HBC staff and the chair. Any commissioner wishing to request the floor on a meeting topic, please use the raise your hand tool. Staff will note commissioners wishing to speak and will advise the chair. Please do not speak unless you are recognized by the chair or staff. For everyone participating in today's virtual meeting, we ask that you follow these guidelines. Please mute your audio when you're not speaking. Use only one source of audio computer or phone, do not put your phone on hold. Make sure you are in a quiet area. Please turn off or silence other electronic devices and do not speak over the person talking or you will be asked to leave the meeting. Please use your raise your hand tool. Do I need to say that again? Please use your raise your hand tool. Jim. Could you tell us how to use, I don't see a raise your hand tool on my screen. Sure. If you look at the bottom right hand corner, very small, there'll be a hand. See it? Okay. Or look at the bottom of your screen. Do they have to look at the chat? Uh, we'll look at I'm the chat. sorry, I don't. Say it again. It's under participants. Okay. I don't see the raise the hand or the chat, but um, I'll be very discreet. Can you go to the. So, hey, Cr Christy. Yes. It's, it's an icon at the bottom of your screen, Damon. It looks like a little hit, a person with three dashes. Hard for me to see. Looks like a little head and shoulders with three dashes. Do you see that? I'm sorry, I don't see that. I see. I'm click on your screen. Click on your screen. It's okay. Do, do you see the menu that comes up at the bottom? If I click on my picture, I've got two circles. One is a uh, minimize myself view, and the other is um, a stop showing myself view. Um, I should I be in a different view on the screen? I don't think you should click on yourself. I think you should click on the main screen. Okay. Nothing happens different if I right or left click on the main screen. I I, I will just be very discreet in, in how I let you know I'm like to speak. And if I see the person with the dashes underneath, I'll use it. Oh wait a minute! In the middle of the screen. There you go. There's a picture and it says participants. It doesn't say. Yeah. So that's the that's the click on that. Whatever you see that says participants, click on that and a, a list of participants should show up on the right hand side of your screen. I see. Raise your hand. I got it. Thank you. Sorry to cause it. Uh, Candace. Yeah. Are, are the van is is Rusty Pinchali and Tim here? Yes. Are they made are they participants? I can flip them over right now. Please do because we want to include them in, in this discussion.
Christy, all four members are now panelists. Okay. Hi, Tim, Rusty, Paul, and Charlie. Welcome. Good afternoon. Um, Thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks for being here. So I am just going to turn it over to y'all to speak. Um, Tim, are you going to be the main presenter? Yeah, yeah, I will. Okay. So um, on our screen, um, I'm just going to start and you tell me when to move forward. I have your presentation loaded and can just have the site plan. And then I also also included the um, close up view of the site plan. Perfect. That's great. Okay. So I, I included the site plan that we looked at um, last month, um, just kind of for reference. There's nothing changed on this since the previous one. Um, we did get some um, clarity for our own purposes on some things like the, the hedge row that was at the top um, by the corner of Belvedere and uh, Thurman. Um, we understand that that hedge row does have to remain in place um, per the uh, approved planning documents, um, the hedge row and the fence. Yeah, exactly right there. Um, so that, that part kind of dictates that, you know, the front doors of those units uh, won't be accessible from, we couldn't have the front doors on Thurman. It wouldn't be accessible from the street because of the hedgerow um, there. So the front doors of those seven would be uh, facing the Van Lanningham estate. Yeah, right there. And then, um, like I said, that's really much but yeah, uh, five, um, the, the garage doors and the front doors along for those five there at the bottom. Um, yep, right there. We're still planning to put the front doors and garages on that side. And then on the private drive down on the, the, the two sets of five, um, those will also have the, the garage doors and the driveways, or sorry, garage doors and the front doors along there. But there are some variations we're looking at, you know, trying to bring the uh, front doors around to the to the corners facing certain streets, like in particular the plaza. Uh, looking at having a front door approach off of plaza, so um, we want to make it feel like it's a you know more like a single family home and less like a block of townhomes. Um, that's the the goal there. Um, and the same thing with the opposite side, where um, the court there, um, where Nassau and the private drive come together. Um, to have more of a single family feel there, there. Yeah. yeah, so that it presents itself to the to that street better. Um, so again, nothing much has changed on these. I just wanted to overview it real quick for you, so you could refresh your memory of the project. Um, if you want to move to the elevations, yes. Yeah. Um, so here, here is a block of five. Um, this is in particular the one that we're looking at that. Um, is facing the plaza. So at the top, the top elevation, that would be the front elevation of the building that faces the, uh, the plaza and would have a front door feel where you can see the kind of that front door with a little canopy piece over it. Um, it has much more of a single family home feel to it. Um, being that these, you know, the density of, of the development um, and, you know, kind of what we have to do to get both the you know, the amount of units on the on the property and, you know, make the place, you know, the way, the way that we want it. Um, it does have kind of a three story with that tower piece on it, that, that kind of feel. So it is, it is a, um, somewhat taller, but it's not, you know, overly tall. Um, and that's the only portion that would have that um, kind of more tower piece to it to kind of denote, denote the uh, corner and also kind of, um, you know, present itself more towards the plaza. Um, and then moving along to the side view, which is the, this was the view that faces the, uh, the private drive. Um, you can see that kind of each unit has its two car garage and there's also a one car garage there in the middle. So we're kind of varying some of them. Um, we tried to put those, the doors together so they kind of individualized around each unit so each person kind of knows that they're that's their unit so that it's not you know a bunch of units that look the same so each one has its own look to it um the corner one of course has more of a brick look um mixed in with some you know darker windows um you know the nicer garage doors you know the 
kind of simulated wood look doors. Um, we are looking at doing a, a metal door, but some, you know, something that has a nice decorative uh, garage door on it. And then the next unit would be more of a siding, uh, you know, some kind of a ship lap or some kind of a lap siding uh, piece for the second piece. And then uh, the middle one, again, we're, we're kind of changing the scale of each one to try to vary the elevation since these, you know, this, these units kind of carry along this whole private street. We don't want it to feel like one big block of townhomes. We want it to kind of have different ins and outs different materials, uh, different ways that the entries occur. So the second unit is going to have kind of recessed entry where it has a little canopy piece to it, you know, where there'd be like almost a little front porch feel. Uh, the next unit would have more of a metal canopy, um, iron type canopy over it. Um, so it kind of be a little different there. And then the next one again is more of a porch feel. And then as you move around to the corner to the end unit, that would have the door on the side that would kind of present itself more towards the courtyard um, side, kind of the more courtyard feel to it. Um, and again, we're, this is kind of our first pass at, at the kind of style we're looking at. You can kind of get an idea of um, what we're looking at as well. Um, and I don't know what, um, do we want to pause at some point and get some feedback from this or do we want to move on to the, our inspiration we had, um, which would be our next slides. That's the question. Would you like them to finish and then talk through? Yeah, why don't, why don't you go ahead and finish your presentation and then let us react. Okay. All right. All right. So keep, keeping these elevations in mind, we'll move to the next slide. You can kind of see some of the materiality we're looking at. Um, we know we can't do painted brick, but we would like to do a lighter brick. Uh, we do see several some places in, in Bidwood that has more of a lighter brick to it. Um, again, we, we like the, the feel of it better. We, you know, we, we like that we do want to make sure that the, the mortar joints can be seen, you know, that you, you understand it is brick. It's not uh, monotonous uh, painted brick. Um, but this is the kind of feel of the brick we're, we're looking at doing. We have some other options as well. Um, let's go to the next slide. Uh, actually, sorry, these are the garage doors. So this is just an example of the kind of garage door we're looking at, um, something with, you know, you know, some windows in it, some the kind of shed barn door type feel so it doesn't look like, you know, a cheap door. It looks like individual doors um, to kind of break up the, the two-car garage door. Um, next slide. Uh, this was some inspiration as well. We, um, we, we particularly like the kind of overhangs and canopies, the, the lighter colored brick with the darker windows, the kind of more iron um, metal windows. Um, we're not necessarily going to do a dark painted siding like we showed there on the far left, but just kind of showing how the, you know, this piece is varying. To kind of give you a reference point to some of the elevation work we've done. And then on the right, the image on the right kind of shows some of the overhang pieces that we're looking at, kind of like the end piece, the courtyard piece, the, how that would, might work where we have some, you know, balconies or or, uh, you know, basically some overhangs with, with some windows in them um, to kind of vary the elevation depth. Next slide. And again, more, more uh, examples. Um, the, the far right, top right one is obviously, you can see where we got a lot of our inspiration from for the, the uh, elevation that faces the, uh, the plaza. Um, that's a, I actually believe that's a home here in Charlotte, I believe over in Chantilly. Um, and then the one on the left kind of shows a mix of the kind of darker metal with the, you know, some of the, this one has brown brick, but we kind of, that shows you a little bit like the flat roof pieces that we have in the, um, uh, in the elevation. It kind of gives you an idea of what we're thinking there. And then the bottom piece is um, the orangery that exists on the site that's very close to our buildings. It's actually on our, I believe it's on our property, or maybe it's not on our property, but real close to it. Um, but it kind of, trying to blend all the, you know, what they're doing there, but also, you know, kind of bridging between, you know, our, the Van Lanningham estate and the, the new modern, um, more modern office building that's going to be adjacent to this as well. Um, so we're kind of a mix, you know, blending those materials. Um, that's pretty much it, I believe. Oh, this was the um, elevation heights showing the different uh, pieces here. Um, I think this was from the previous submittal we were looking at. So we're, we're going to take into consideration the scale of our um, our buildings as it relates to the Van Lanningham estate and, um, 
you know, because I'm sure that Van Allen kind of has to kind of stay present as the as the uh, the, the main focus of it. So. Yes, we do not have a street skate for the plaza. So this is Belvedere uh, across the street from Van Lanningham, and the Thurman Place is behind the Correct. So Belvedere, this is the big house on the corner of Belvedere, the Pogo house. That's that streetscape. And then the other streetscape is looking at Thurman. And those yeah. were part of the previous, um, mainly because of heightened context, especially when talking about um, the relationship of the parking and the doors facing the alley. And um, I will order the one for the plaza. That's great. Okay. Well, I think our biggest thing we'd like to get feedback on is the elevation and, um, I mean, anything else also, and some of our materiality um, as far as the bricks and things we're looking at. Um, so if anyone has any any comments or questions. I'll, I'll open it up. Um, you should raise your hand button. If you wish to make comments, please. DJ? Yeah, um, yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great. All right, so just just a couple of comments. Uh, my first comment is I absolutely see the relationship from your inspiration pictures back to your design. That, that's great. Um, however, we need to see inspiration from historic structures within the historic district and how that relates back to your design. That That's really that's really the key, right? How how can we have this multi how can we have this multifamily project relate to how multifamily projects were done eighty plus years ago? So I I really think that we need to address that first, and because I'm just not seeing I'm not I'm not seeing a lot of the historical details to multifamily as it relates to Plaza Midwood. I'm seeing some great other inspirational photographs, but not again as it relates to historic and Plaza. Okay. And uh, just just an, another an, another comment. I, I know I mentioned. I just want to make sure it's clear. When we're looking at massing, when we're looking at height, when we're looking at scale of the project, we need to compare multifamily historic multifamily examples to this project. So multifamily to multifamily, single family home to single family home. So when you're looking for that inspiration in the historic district, look for multifamily and look for originally historic. Obviously not something that's, you know, five, 10, 15, you know, years old. Chris Barth? Um, Does the, um, oh, someone else raised their hand. know the height of your proposed elevation versus say like several structures surrounding like the Van Landingham? I mean, it'll vary because the, the site that, um, so the the one that's facing the kind of taller elevation that's facing the plaza um, is at a lower elevation than the Van Lanningham Estate. Um, but I can I can definitely put the height of basically what we're looking at is the reference of the elevation as it relates to the Van Lanningham. So um, I mean I think our goal is to not get higher than the Van Lanningham Estate. Is that something that you guys would uh, be looking for? So typically when we look at these buildings in, in street elevation, we like you know, to follow that topo line down, referencing the elevation versus doing a, a datum line straight across. Um, you know, I'd be curious to see how this building elevates on the landscape compared to the, the larger buildings on the line. Um, to me, it seems a little very tall. I'm not sure that we have a precedent that kind of a line. Yeah, we our goal would be not to try not to overpower the the estate. Um, and since the property is, I can't remember how how far down below the estate it is, but it is a significant amount below. I'm not sure if the we'll go back to the site plan. If you can find a elevation hike on there uh, or not, um, can you go back on the slide?
Uh, Christy, can you go back on the slide? Sure. Yeah. I don't know if I have the if I have the elevation heights on there or not. No, I don't. They're on there. Um, but yeah, we can we can we can definitely show you that. Um, we haven't gotten that kind of far as you know into looking at the streetscape as well. Um, I think like. Christy said they're going to order the, the plaza streetscape to, to see how those heights relate to ours. Um, but our goal is to try not to overpower. Plus, these, these buildings aren't as aren't as um, aren't as massive as far as the the width of them goes. So it's going to it's going to be a, a challenge to try to you know. And we're doing different heights as well. So um, but yeah, we'll, we'll we'll take a look at that and see. Take it into consideration. It's um it is it is a challenge for us to try to get. The, try not to overpower, but also try to make sure we have enough square footage to, to justify the purchase of the property and the, the land itself. What What is the height of the four-story corner? Uh, uh, the four-story corner? Next is uh, John Ferry. Yes. Uh, okay. So just to clarify, the 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 Van, Van Landingham estate sits higher than the apartment, is that correct? than the professional construction, correct? Yeah, except for on the right side, the, um, the block of seven, they sit pretty close to the same. But, but is it not true that uh, the, the proposed new construction would, for the most part, block the view of the Van Landingham? View from where? Uh, from, say, across the street. Uh, uh, across, no, we're not. I mean, over here. Who's got the plan? Me. Okay, to the right, to the right of. The, just go to the right of the screen. Keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. Right here. That's outside the district. That is outside the district. Yes, sir. The okay. district ends right here. Okay. How about down below? This is this is in the district. This is not in the district. Okay. Are you saying then that that we have no jurisdiction over the Besides facing the. Oh, no. I'm not saying that. I'm just letting you know where the district line is. It's right here. Okay. Well, I guess that that is uh, okay. That I mean, but we cannot require the applicant. What you're saying is you cannot require the applicant to respond to that. What is across the street? Is that correct? To re respond to that character that is so not um, in the district um in the past the applicant has used the existing conditions of what falls along thurman as justification for why parking and parking can be on this um, street pace um this building i believe is new construction and not a historic building um, there are historic buildings across the street. This is within the district. If these three are not, but they are still historic buildings. What what street is that? I, I this can't... is Belvedere right here, and the plaza. That's plaza. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So right. So the, the Van Landingham is facing plaza, correct? Right? Correct. Right. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Yep. Okay. What about below? Uh, is is that within the district? Right here, here, yeah, where you are. Yes. Now. So what this is, there is there is an existing house right here that they are demolishing, and there's a house I believe right here that's not in the district, and they are um, running. Yes, is there a street run. there where your cursor is? This is a street. This is a new private drive that's providing connectivity between the plaza and Nassau, and this parcel. My mistake. This parcel is not within the district. Okay, so there These is no are, street down there. there is, this is Nassau. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. I, okay, so that all of that being said, I guess I would, uh, I would really like to uh, uh, piggyback on what uh, PJ was saying in terms of, um, of uh, even though this is sort of an odd situation, I think that. Uh, the inspiration in order to meet the guidelines for context and character. Uh, I think the inspiration needs to come from the district. Um, uh, and 
I want to make sure that we're not asking the applicant to do to create what uh, a, a former director of this commission used to call fake old. Uh, in other words, we don't live like people lived when houses were built 80, 100 years ago. Uh, but there are some characteristics that are worthy of being brought forward, uh, whether it's massing or detailing or, 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 or whatever. Uh, I, I think I would like to hear uh, how that responds to the historic architecture in the district. I think a good approach for this applicant would be to look at the guidelines for new construction and uh, and go down each one and tell us how this is how we met massing. This is how we met scale. This is how we met, you know, I mean, literally, what is it? There's 10, 10 requirements there in the, in the, uh, in the chart. You know, this is how we uh, successfully achieved each one of these uh, requirements. And, uh, and that would really help uh, us to be able to evaluate how, uh, whether or not this project complies with the guidelines. Um, I, I, yeah, and hey, what's, not not seeing any, you know, we just see their building. We don't see how it ties to the district, which is what we've got to measure it against and, how, and evaluate it in terms of the guidelines. So we're not getting that information. Those, those are my comments. Damon? Yeah, hello. Um, several things. I the, the, the plaza the plaza elevation is a three and a half story um, elevation, which really isn't anywhere else in the neighborhood. Um, and I think that three and a half continues all the way across on the uh, on the private driveway side. Um, I have a lot of objection to the height of the structure. I think that we've watched in the past to compare it to existing um, historic structures in the neighborhood, and this just doesn't compare to any of them. Um, the Van Landingham is only one uh, house in the in the entire neighborhood, and this is actually closer to some of the other houses, and it needs to relate to the what's in the neighbor what's in the neighborhood as much as it does to the Van Landingham estate. So, my first comment is that the plaza the plaza um, elevation is is too large. It's too tall. It, I, I don't think it fits our guidelines for the for the height. Um, as for the private driveway, I kind of like that elevation in terms of the variation in facades, um, in scale and materials, roof lines. I think that's good. But here again, we're at three and a half stories. Uh, and I, I have a problem with that. It's not as a public view as the one on the plaza. So I think it should merit some flexibility, the garage doors facing the street and that. Um, but I, still think that the that the height of it is is problematic um the garage doors also are very horizontal um they they need to at least attempt to look like carriage doors that have more of a um two individual doors that are married together rather than uh just moldings put on top of a very wide garage door um the I have a, a lot of problem with the backside of the property facing, I think it's NASA and thermal. Um, we do not have garage doors facing streets anywhere in the neighborhood. It has it has nothing to do with how that, so in that on Thurman on across uh, the let me let me are, let me just finish uh, my 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 presentation okay. and then um, okay. I have a I have a big problem with that, and I don't think I will ever vote for garage doors facing the street, especially if there's a driveway right up against them. Um, I have a big problem with that. I know that presents you with some problems, but uh, that just is not part of what there's just nowhere in the district that 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 I know of. It's not, there are one or two individual exceptions that I know in uh, um, Wesley Heights, I believe, but um, Anyway, so I have a, a big problem with that. Um, I just don't think you're really considering the neighborhood. You're really just looking at the Van Landingham estate 
and making sure that it relates to some of those elements. But I think you're ignoring and turning your back on the on the rest of the neighborhood. I'm done. Jessica. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Um my response honestly, I mean, I think that this presentation is really is really beautiful and attractive, but my response is actually the bigger picture of the um the Van Landingham sort of being the iconic landmark and centerpiece of Plaza Midwood. And we've had lots of conversations about this as it relates to Wadsworth and Wesley Heights. And um, I think it would be um, very difficult to approve the height of the plaza facing elevation in light of the fact that we really, the mandate to this commission is to preserve the character of the district and honoring the character of the Van Landingham as the iconic landmark property in Plaza Midwood is, is really is really a major aspect of that context. Um, the Van Landingham is also set very far back on the property. Christy, if you can go back to the set, the site plane. I mean, if we were to produce a 3D model of this site with the three and a half story elevation up against the plaza and the Van Landingham set, you know, almost aligned with the sixth unit back, I think it would just um, really overwhelm the, the character of the Van Landingham. Um, I think that's really my, that's really my big picture perspective on it is the Van Landingham still, still needs to read as the iconic landmark that it is in Plaza Midwood. Anybody else? No? Yeah, sorry. Jill? Oh, did you say Jill? Yep. What do you feel? Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, the full story feel of that, that building, um, I'm not really comfortable with either of those. Uh, I, I also have a note here about the doors. I think you were talking about steel doors or simulated wood doors. I didn't. I didn't understand that. You could comment on that. Sure. The the doors um, we're proposing to do would be it would be a metal door, um, but it's they're they're made to be more like a carriage door. So they have the, the kind of wood slats, but they're not actually wood. You're talking about the garage doors now. Correct. Yeah, the regular doors would be wood, wood doors, the entry doors. And I, I don't know. That's something. I don't know if that's something you guys would approve or not. Are you probably not? I don't know if that's allowed as far as the material goes. It depends on the door. We would just need to see specs. Yeah. There have been times that they yeah. have been possible for it. Yeah. yeah. And these are made to look like. We really do want to give you, I feel like we really do want to give you some direction with this, and it sounds like you've really put an effort into it. And I, I wonder if some of the challenge for you and in what you've presented is your efforts to both nod to the Van Landingham estate. And then I think you also mentioned nodding to some of the modern buildings that are in the vicinity. In that, in that effort, that might sometimes create something that doesn't really nod to anything. It just, it, it just might be better to pick, pick one, you know? So the, on the, and I don't know, it's not shown on, shown on the site plan, but there is a plan for the, a more modern office building in between the Van Lanningham and our property. Um, I'm sure you guys probably know about it, but right in between there, there's a very modern kind of all glass looking modern building that I think Clock might be designing. Um, and I don't know if that's been presented or not to you guys yet. This is Christy. Um, we saw a presentation I think a year ago at this time at a workshop for the living kind of greenhouse type building, um, but they have not 
and that came back to the commission to talk to that. Okay. Um, so basically then, if it's not approved, then it's not something we can really respond to. We, we right. have some initial designs, um, but I'm sure maybe in a street steep elevation, it might be helpful to you know drop that building in. Um, and I can certainly help coordinate that when we get those out while serving to you. Okay. I, I did have a question too, just in general. You know, we could keep talking about referencing the existing in the, the existing character of the neighborhood for our project, you know, in the district. Um, there isn't a lot of, or hardly any multifamily that I know of in, in Midwood. I know there's a, there's a funny looking kind of, it's almost like a 60s, 70s type project down the road. I can't remember the name of it. Um, it's um, on the plaza. Um, that one, to me, doesn't have as much character. It's, it's a, I'm sure it was done well before the district was uh, established. Um, is that the kind of things that we're looking for? I, I just don't know where, unless we're just pulling from single family homes, it's hard to pull context from, um, for this for our project, we don't really have a, a multifamily example, a good multifamily example. Um, unless we're talking about the Charlotte Historic District, there might be some of those ones on East Boulevard, like you've recently approved. Uh, you know, I, I know PJ made that comment about uh, comparing it to other multifamily, and I. I would tend to agree. Um, I, I don't, I, you know, I, I don't know Plaza Midwood block by block all that well, but uh, I think it would probably. I think you're right. It would probably be very difficult to um, to find anything to pull from from the few multifamily you, you might be able to, but it, it, it just seems what uh, what my uh, my recollection is there's there's not a whole lot so. I would go um, with the character of, of any architecture that's in the historic district. Now, Jim, can I go ahead and, and I wanted to amend the comment that I made earlier, if I could. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, I, and I, I was talking about pulling from the character of the, uh, of, the, of the district now. And since that conversation has come up is, is how are you responding to the Van Landingham, which is a landmark? Uh, I think you you could go as the architects. You could go uh, either way with that, but you have to say, okay, we're going to respond to this el these elements, this massing, these detailing from the neighborhood, from the historic district uh, uh, surrounding, or we're going to we're going to use the materials and the massing, uh, the fenestration that the Van Landingham uh, estate has. We're going to we're going to respond to that now. I do remember the cluck design that was presented, and if I remember correctly, the whole idea of that design was it just disappeared into the landscape. And that's about as respectful to the Van Landingham as you can be. Uh, I had a um, historic preservation officer with the state once tell me when you're dealing with historic properties, uh, the architect needs to sort of put his hat in his hands and uh, and be respectful to that which is historic. Uh, so, for instance, one way of doing that might be to use the same materials as Van Landingham and, and some of the massing, but just tone it down and let that stand uh, taller than 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 everything else uh, that is surrounding. So, those are those are my comments. I think you could go either way in terms of uh, deciding to, where to pull the character from. DJ, yeah. Just to add on what Mr. Ferris was saying, look for multifamily in Plaza um, for your inspiration. And if you strike out, start expanding that search into the other historic districts. Again, the key is, you know, historic, historic multifamily. Start in Plaza, go look in Wilmore, look in Dilworth. Um, again, basing your design based on something that's a year, five years, 15 years old is, is most likely not going to, is most likely not going to work. say that if you are because you did mention some of our recent projects just know that they did what the gentlemen have just mentioned which is they pulled from a school they pulled from the church they made sure that they were not going 
much taller or wider than the existing structure they were uh, replacing. Gotcha. Can I ask one question about the, the height piece? Is uh, is three stories going to be a problem? Does it need to be look more like a two story building with a three story and a half half story? I I mean the the only way that we can can even begin to answer that question is is for us to. Uh, show for you to show us the proposed new construction relative to uh, the context. I mean, and say this is what we have, and we think it works because of this. Uh, and, I mean, it, it's it, we 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 are uh, unable to make a generic statement. In my opinion, that three stories just won't work. I mean, we we have to see it relative to uh, the setting. Yeah. Jim, could I respond to the to that question? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, the height of the building needs to respond to the to the buildings around it. Um, so there, that to my knowledge, there are no three three story buildings around us. Um, so for me, I'm not sure how you can put a three story building there. Um, uh, and then you have, a, I think yours is three story and a half. It's not even just three stories. Um, and, you know, you, if you start looking outside of Plaza, for the Plaza Midwood area, you can find some fairly large buildings. But I think it needs to relate to things that are fairly, I mean, you can widen a little bit, but to go to other districts to try to find a building that fits in this neighborhood, I think is a stretch. Now there is that uh, multifamily that's down the street, um, very very rectangular, um, and it is not a typical building of uh, of Plaza Midwood, and is not definitely not of the era that the that the uh, neighborhood was built. So um, there's no question in my mind that three and a half stories is is too high for this location. Okay. Any other comments for our applicants? This is Jessica Heinemann. Um, I'll echo actually two of John Ferris's comments. I think it's impossible for us to answer that definitively without seeing um, all of the streetscapes. Um, I suspect that once we have all of the streetscape evidence, it will not support three and a half stories, but there's no way to definitively answer it without that exhibit. Um, but also, I think John's advice just to take the list of the, uh, I think, 11 new construction guidelines. What's that on page 6.12 or something? Um, and literally just use it as a checklist and, um, in the presentation. Uh, find the exhibits uh, or create the exhibits that you would need to, um, to graphically um, represent clients with that checklist. 6.1 in there. Sorry, I'm interested. What is the last page of that chapter that has the, the checklist on it? 6.16. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. I think we've given you what we can give you today. Okay. I think it's good feedback. Um, you, we will focus more on the guidelines. Um, you know, we, we were trying to get this to the point where we could get at least some feedback to see what kind of direction we we're moving towards. Um, but I think it's good feedback for our pre-application review. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Everybody, uh, read the minutes. Jim, this is Jessica Heinemann. I read all of the minutes from start to finish. And me too. This is Damon. <laughs> I know you can't believe it. <laughs> it looks great to me. Okay. I will entertain a motion. Uh, 
I move to approve the February 2020 meeting minutes. Do you need a separate motion? Or may? I move to approve the February 2020 meeting minutes. I second. This is Damon. Okay, move and second to approve the February meeting minutes. We need a roll call, please. Roll call okay. them, everybody. Um, pre Chairman, it might be easier if we interview and ask for a name. Okay. Everyone, take your um, phone off of you. PJ. PJ, yes. Chris, Nuren. Chris, yes. Kim. Kim, yes. Jessica. Jessica, yes. Michelle. Michelle, yes. Krista. Yes. Alan Ferris. Aye. Walker. Damon. Yes. Jim Jordan. Aye. Chris Bart. Yes. Yeah. All right. How about Ms. I move to approve the May 2020 meeting minutes. This is Jessica. And this is Damon. I second. We've been seconded by Jessica and Damon to uh, approve the uh, May meeting minutes. Any discussion? If not, PJ? PJ, yes. Chris Marin? Chris, yes. Kim? Kim, yes. Jessica? Jessica, yes. Michelle? Michelle, yes. Yes. John? Aye. Jill? Yes. Damon? Yes. Jim Jordan? Aye. Jim Hart? Yes. Jim Hayden? Aye. Unanimous? Okay. We'll do the officers now. The proposed slate, if you will go back to this time last year, we already had the arrogance to decide we were going to who who was going to be the officers for the coming year uh that has not changed in my mind well, we've got an excellent slate of officers so i would entertain a motion that we accept the slate of officers this is jessica i move to accept the slate of officers damon move a uh, second been seconded to accept the slate of officers as presented. Kim for chair, PJ for vice chair, Jessica for second vice chair. Do we have any other discussion or nominations? Okay, we'll take a roll call. PJ? PJ, yes. Chris Murren? Chris, yes. Kim? Yes. Jessica? Jessica? Can you hear me? Jessica, yes. Okay. Michelle? Michelle, yes. Krista? Yes. John? Aye. Jill? Yes. Damon? Yes. Jim Jordan? Aye. Chris Park? Yes. Jim Hayden? Yes. Unanimous. Congratulations. Okay. There goes the neighborhood. Oh, look out. <laughs> <laughs> so for procedural updates. All yours, Christy. Okay, so um, there are a lot of things going on with the state and internally with the planning department. So I'm gonna start at the bottom of this slide. Um, there is, they are completely renewing the general statute that enables the Historic District Commission to meet. They're not making major changes to the Historic District Commission um, portion, but they are changing the statute reference from 160A to 160D. And that's for all land development and zoning, and that is going into effect January 2021. So Andrea um, contacted me and said, hey, we need to start thinking about updating these rules for procedures. And we had already talked about some minor updates at past board retreats that we need to make. Um, so 
that started all this. And then also with the zoning ordinance and the work that the greater planning department is doing to create a unified development ordinance is also changing some of our internal references because the rules of procedure will reference the zoning ordinance and 160A. Um, so with that, Andrea and I have started looking at the rules for procedure and just making sure that I guess they haven't had a full update in a number of years. And Andrea is also doing this with all of her other boards and commissions that she supports. Um, for, and these are the big bucket areas on this slide of what we're looking to, to change. They're not major changes. Um, the demolition requirement is a bit out of date. It, it doesn't align with what we currently require in our guidelines and in our meeting procedures. So it's just about making all of these things seamless across all of our documents. Uh, approvals with conditions we talked about last fall at our November board retreat. And you know, again, a lot of thanks to Commissioner Hinman who um, really helped us settle on the 180 days as a reasonable time frame rather than 30. Um, it's just 30 days when a project is approved with conditions um, is just not enough to, for the architects to get, get that, get the project engineered and get construction drawings. And we don't want to have, currently, we would have to have people submit revised plans with the approval of conditions and then submit us another set of plans that are their construction drawings. And we just want to make it as easy as possible on both staff and the applicants. Um, the addition of some new sections. So we have been doing our pre-application workshop and we just need to codify that about uh, what those procedures are. Most importantly, our, our key with allowing people like what we just had with Van Landing Camp is that they cannot have submitted an application yet. Uh, but we don't have that written down anywhere. So we need to make sure that that's written down in our rules for procedures. We also have been issuing a lot of emergency CUAs the past two years with all of the storms and tree, trees damaged. That's allowed, staff is allowed to do that under the general statute, but we don't talk about it in our rules for procedure and we thought staff thought that was an important addition. Um, the other addition is what we just approved in January of 2020 with local district designation process. It's codifying that within the greater rules for procedure. And then there's been discussion that if we have designation pr process, we also have to have a de-designation process in the event that that would come up and what that looks like. And I have been having some initial talks with Andrea about that, as well as the state. Um, and that's based on you know, past inquiries that we've had from neighborhoods and, and streets and neighborhoods. And we just want to be clear on what that process is and make sure that that aligns with 160D. And since we're doing a rules for procedure update, these were the things that we thought were important to cover. And we wanted to provide this information to the commission as a heads up that this was going on. Um, Andrea and I have a draft that we are working on but before we got too far, we wanted to check in with everyone and see if there was something we're missing or have forgotten. Um, and just give you a heads up that you will be seeing this at an upcoming workshop or perhaps retreat. Chairman? Yes, John Ferris? Yes, uh, is there, are there any new developments or any new information on the uh, tree removal in terms of the, at the state level? Not that I've in heard. In terms of our guidelines? Not that I've level. heard. Um, I do know, I think I might turn that over to Jill and Jim since they were on that ad hoc advisory tree committee. Um, I'm not sure to what extent the general statute in 160D addresses that. That's an excellent question, and I am glad to look into that. Jim, anything? Any news? Yeah, I, no, I, okay. I don't have anything to do okay. Yeah, I don't recall anything of the district commission. Okay, thank you both. Okay. okay. Christy, I would just like to, this is Jessica, sorry. I'd just like to thank you guys to, for the changes to the pre-application workshop procedures. I think it's made it a more meaningful process and there's less abuse of that process mm -hmm. with the new, um, with the changes that you guys have made. So thank you for that. Thank you. And it gives us more time to review it. So as a commissioner, thank you. Great. 
I'm glad it's working. Uh, okay, next, design guidelines. Um, I'm going to flip how I'm going to present this. I'm going to start with giving you an update on phase two. We are, the contract has been sent to Fraser and Associates for phases two, three, and four. We have phase one, um, and the completion dates listed are the completion dates for, um, at least for phase one, was when Fraser and Associates gave us the draft of Oakland Park. And we're going to be talking about um, those changes next because there are some edits that we need made to those. But they, as soon as they sign that contract, and um, hopefully within the next couple of weeks, they will get started on working on drafting guidelines for multifamily buildings and have a draft to us sometime in August for review, followed by guidelines for commercial development, hopefully in October. Also, as part of that October timeframe, they have scheduled a site visit to come down and, and meet with us. And we are hoping to coordinate that either in conjunction with a workshop at a commission meeting or perhaps a longer um, mini retreat to just give some really concerted feedback on both multifamily and commercial to the to, to Bill and Kathy. Um, and then in November and December, they will work on doing changes to all of the guidelines. And that phase four also includes tweaks to existing guidelines. We've we've gone through it at the staff level. Um, you know, we've noticed things from everywhere from spelling errors to drawing errors. Um, and maybe making some things more clear on solar panels that we currently don't have in there. Um, and just some other areas of things that just need a little bit of tweaking. Um, so the reason I'm bringing this up is because staff, all three of us have gone through pretty closely and we've been keeping lists and we've compiled that list, but we want to hear from you. Are there are there pain points in our existing guidelines, something that we need to be clarified to help the applicants understand our intent? Um, and this is this is our charge to you to just start thinking about that and keep a list. And when you feel that you've got a, a full list, send that over to staff and we will compile all of those um, for the for Fraser and Associates. I would like to put a deadline on this because I don't know about y'all, but if I just ask someone to, if someone asks me to do something and I don't have a deadline, it tends to fall down my to-do list. Um, so I would like to ask for this by the August meeting as our first deadline. Um, and that would be, let me check my calendar. August 12th is, is y'all's deadline. And it's just updates to the guideline book, the current guideline book. Any questions? I, I mean, given the current budget situation and COVID crisis, uh, I am really thrilled that we have been able to encumber these funds under this current budget year, because had we not waited for next year, um, this could have been stuck yeah. <laughs> to the chopping block. So um, I would just like to thank some of our administrative staff and um, my boss who really helped us make sure that we got this um, finished up. So. Christy, um, yes. I have a few comments on the uh, Oakland Park. Yes, that's um, next. Should I, okay, uh, yep. should I say something or should I let you introduce it first? I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, yeah, so with Oakland Park, uh, staff kind of did the same thing. We we sent out the clean version of the design guidelines to everybody. Um, Jessica, I know you're in travel mode today, so thank you for sending your comments ahead of time. Um, but we didn't want to influence your thoughts one way or another based on our thoughts. And I just do want to open this up for general discussion. Um, and if there are really specific critical changes, we're glad to talk one-on-one um, -on -one as well. Um, but Damon, I welcome you. I will turn the floor over to you. Okay, I'll, I'll try to make it quick. Um, 
in the uh, in the very beginning, it mentions um, the mid-century modern, uh -huh. um, and most of the mid-century modern. So there's mid-century modern, uh, and then there's uh, Oakland Park. Right. It looks to me like Oakland Park has mostly small houses. That there are not a lot of the ranch, the split level, and the bi-level houses. Um, so I, unless I'm wrong about that, and in fact those three architectural styles are in Oakland Park. It was a little confusing to introduce those three architectural styles um, in this section. So I just, I, you don't have to respond now, but I just was a little confused as to why that was in there, unless those architectural styles are in Oakland Park. Sure, um, I think that's great. So one of the things that they were trying to do, um, especially in this section, and this is a supplement for now, but it will be, combined into our new guidelines. So especially the style section, we asked them to include some of the mid-century in the event that we get other districts that may have a split level and a bi-level since we were already asking them to update on the ranch. Um, um, and the only reason I felt that was in this, in this section of the guideline under Oakland Park is that it invites renovations that might go toward that kind of design as opposed to being a little more restrictive about staying as a small um, small house. Okay. Yes. Agreed. Well received. Um, I, I, um, yes. Go ahead. Uh, I only have two other items. Okay. Um, one is um, page six. There's a there's a discussion about the porch and being really a front stoop and a planter. Uh huh. And um, in in if and so a hypothetical if they if someone were to want to turn that planter into part of a front porch. Um, is that planter a real important feature um, of that front porch, which is what it sounded like? And therefore, it's really, you wouldn't want to turn it into front porch? Or is it kind of flexible? And I just, that was kind of just a question that came up as I was reading through that. Um, and then the last one was on page nine, when they were talking about the awnings, um, color became a uh, they talked about not having certain colors and we've never really, I don't think we, except painting brick, we've never really addressed color. Um, and I'm not sure that that should we start there yeah. and that's it. I'll, I'll go mute and listen. No, I think these are all excellent Damon and quite frankly, things I hadn't thought of, um, especially when it comes to inviting changes with the split level and the bi level. Um, the planter, it's very widespread in these small little ranch houses in Oakland Park. So I think that's something that I would like to hear from other, other commissioners, how they feel about that. Um, I, <laughs> Jessica, you have your hand raised. Jessica. So, uh, so I had a very strong response to the exact same image of the planter on the porches. Do you want to wait and hear from the other commissioners since you already, or do you want me to go ahead and give it? Fire away. Go ahead. Um, uh, you know, before I start, I'll say, Damon, we do have a comment about color in our roof guideline that we've leaned on from time to time when people have asked for metal roof replacements. And I have no idea how that plays into awnings or not, but that one's there and we've used it from time to time. I am uh, yeah, kind of a strong response to the image of the the porch guideline with the image of the planter. I think that's a um, that's a really that's a really special detail on mid century houses, and it's something that we should be celebrating. And I really felt like the the language that was used in the caption uh, had some moral overtones. I think the mid century um, homes that we are trying to celebrate and the the district and its character that we're trying to celebrate has a world of subtlety to it and um the way that i think we need to reword uh that section and there were some others christy that i put on my list too that i had concerns about some moral overtones in the wording um, that did not celebrate the architecture appropriately for the level of effort that this community has put into being a part of um, a district Um, one thing to talk about, and maybe now is the time to talk about it, with color, there's been some discussion on a listserv 
that a historic preservation listserv that I've been on about color. And I can't remember, Susan, tell me, was it Annapolis? I think it was, I think it's Annapolis, but they, how they deal with it is, is color intrinsic to the material. So I, I was, I've been thinking about this a lot the last week, especially in how we talk about brick. And when I get questions of what color brick is appropriate, um, I think we can also bring this into metal and awnings if we so choose. But I think we need to phrase it as part of being intrinsic to the material itself and not being something that's applied. Um, and I just offer that for thoughts and feedback to the commission. Uh, we have Michelle. How are you? Yes, I it, I didn't want to mention anything that different than has already been mentioned, but just someone that's familiar with this um, neighborhood and um, a lot of the homes there, I would definitely say that um, planter near the front door is um, pretty um distinct and i think it has a lot of uh, a lot to the character of the neighborhood so i would definitely like to see that be something um that is maintained uh, within the guidelines thank you um jim jordan hey chrissy just more of a question to try to understand so you were looking to create these guidelines a little bit more all-encompassing than just oakland park and i know you had a go under the one picture that shows garages on, on the front of the house are you thinking about trying to find another picture that references kind of garages on the front of the house where what page do you see that on jim um it was on page four the last house yeah you're right this isn't from charlotte yeah, it's a music Charlotte example. I guess I was just trying to dive in there. Were we expecting to? I have no idea. Through? That's an excellent. That's thank you. Good eyes. Okay. Um, that does lead me to something that I did want to share that staff noted. Um, if you look on page page sixteen, the very last page, and it talks about accessory buildings, guidelines for private sites, and carports. And historically in our districts, car carports have not existed. We have the separate garages in the rear yard. But as you look at some of the these mid-century neighborhoods, Oakland Park, even to some extent in McMurray Heights, um, you start seeing the carports next to the building. And that's a, that's a big departure from what we have allowed in our other districts. And I had a, a pretty significant note on this page that we needed to, to point this out as a special characteristic of Oakland Park that while yes, garages are typically in the rear yard in Oakland Park, perhaps garages carports are in the side yard um, as pictured actually on page 16. Comments, questions, oh, Jessica? Yeah, sorry, that had been one of my other big hits in the list I sent you. I really think um, that we ought to give, you know, a little more billing to the importance of cars in this, in, in this era of, of architecture. And I think we need a better photo for the carport. There are beautiful carports that are really, authentic to this time period and the one that the photo that's in there does not do that justice so i would like <laughs> okay are I you just saying it was like the sweetest uh -huh. little carport with a little shed <laughs> um but yeah we can look for well, it is sweet it is sweet but i i um but i almost um but i i think it's one important that it be in there and i'm glad that you guys put it in there but i um i would love to call it out somewhere else too because i think it's a really important um you know like the the front walks address the driveway not the streets and the driveway is a a meaningful component of the site and the i just feel like we need to give it a little bit more airtime the the relationship with the car in this type of architecture 
the front walks was that's thank you for bringing that up that's another area that is such a departure from our other neighborhoods um, because in, in this architecture the the walk goes to the driveway right. as opposed to the sidewalk right i mean it's totally part of that vocabulary shifting that focus to the automobile um, any other Big picture things that we need to look at. Uh, I'm not really sure the color should come into play here. I mean, if you look at a lot of mid-century, look at a lot of mid-century uh, awnings specifically, and looking in at these carports as well. Some of them came with pre-finished uh, color on them and that sort of thing. I mean, you, you've seen you know, blues. Blue and white stripe, green, you know, all sorts of colors. So I don't think we should really regulate that. Yeah, garish is kind of subjective. Yeah, <laughs> agreed. Anybody else? Sorry, this is Jessica. I, I don't want to go down a rabbit hole here exactly, but the. Um, the graphic examples of additions are, are we, these homes are extraordinarily, the ridge lines are extraordinarily low. Like we're going to see them coming in at, you know, 14, 15 feet on a regular basis. Are we suggesting that we would not consider a contemporary addition that is slightly taller than the line? I would say, this is Damon, I would say definitely. Where this is probably, and I was, I even had this in my notes or looking at this. This neighborhood is probably going to be the most restrictive in terms of keeping the houses as what they are than any of the other neighborhoods. There's not a lot of variety in this neighborhood. And all of, as far as I know, all of them are very small and they're very low. Um, in order to start allowing those, would we'll definitely make a change in the character of the neighborhood. So I, in my opinion, I think that we are going to be very restrictive in terms of what can be added and how high it can go. Jessica, did you have um, examples in mind of what you're thinking of? Because I think it's hard for maybe, it is for me at least, to visualize what you mean by... Um, that's, a, that's a totally fair question. I wonder if one of the Chris's could weigh in on this too. I um I do not, or if, or if John Ferris, one of the other architects, John Ferris, maybe could speak to it. I, I do not have a specific example in mind, and I think Damon makes a really fair point. I think what it, more than that, more than, I, I didn't want to rule out that possibility by the graphics that we're presenting in the guidelines, but I'm not really sure uh, what the answer is. But more than that, I know that we had run into it on a couple of times, a couple of times, in recent years where the that the height and bridge line restriction is written has led us to uh, create some contradictions with other guidelines and this maybe falls into your last phase guideline revision and maybe it's something we discuss later but we had talked about like a a very small variance in bridge height rather than a strict reading of it um, i don't think this is the place for that um, and i think damon makes a really good point um, but I think it's going to be incredibly challenging. Yeah, I, I would like to weigh in on that. If I, could. Um, I mean, along with the, uh, the, we were talking about the automobile, the carport, the sidewalks, and all of that. I think, you know, this era uh, was moving out of the city. You go to this neighborhood and buy a car and a walker. Um, you know, we lose a lot of detail uh, because you're you're not walking and looking at people. You're driving by at 35 miles an hour, uh, probably even more. The lots are larger. The houses began to sprawl out. There, it, it, it's, it's just a different. And I think to start adding, you know, adding second stories, it, 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 it not only aesthetically but in so many ways, it really. Um, Flies in the face of what this architecture was, is. 
I mean, it, 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 like I say, it's it's more to it than just the aesthetic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it's the it's the history. So uh, I, I, I that, that's my feeling. I agree, and you know we say this all the time that each district, although they're all historic, they all kind of speak a different language. They have their own culture, their own feel to them, and so this is no exception to that. And Jessica and I were talking about this a couple of weeks ago. Uh, to your point, John, that historically things were a little different. It was really about the car then. And so to highlight the things that make this particular neighborhood different but still uh, historic, I think is really important. So many of our other neighborhoods, our, our context issues, our streetscape issues, relationship to the street and the sidewalk and grade and trees and all that kind of stuff don't relate here at all. You know, it has a totally different character, a totally different feel, and we need to make sure that that state, because that's that's what these folks want. That's why they came here. That's why they want to be a historic district. They like what they got. And we, I don't think we want to have people come in here and start planting rows of Leland Cypress down the front of the yard to create problems. And there's all kinds of things we need to be careful about. But I think especially putting a second story on the back of those things is You know, I, 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 one thing I would like to propose is that we try to make some kind of an arrangement where the commission takes a field trip and goes out there and sees all of this together collectively. Yeah. Listen to each other talk about what we, what we see and what we appreciate and what we didn't realize was there from our discussions to this point so when we understand what it is we're getting ready to. Thank you. That's great. And I'd love to open the neighborhood leaders um, to that. So, yeah, sure. We'll work on that when, uh, when we're allowed to meet in greater than groups of 10. <laughs> well, we'll um, also be outside. Well, so, yeah. it's okay. a little different. Okay. That's excellent. Um, the other thing that you know, really struck me as I was reading the guidelines and and really reflecting on this neighborhood is they they have no retaining walls there are no front yard fences mm -hmm. and i think that's a really important characteristic of the streetscape of these streets even though some of them do have you know the large sloping front yards there aren't retaining walls you may see a couple alongside of a driveway um especially i believe it is on Miguel. Um, as the elevation changes pretty steeply, but that's about it. And so I have made those notes as well in the guidelines that this is another area where this neighborhood is different, and as well as there are um, chain link fences here. But chain link fences were of the period of the 1950s and 60s, and so that's another huge departure from our, our other districts. Yeah, so. and again, I think that goes to the sprawling site. Yep. I mean, it's why build something vertical when you can slope that ground? <laughs> you got plenty of room, which is a lot different than most of the uh, city settings that we're that most of our uh, districts are in town. Setting. I mean, it's that's a great observation. Back to that. Distinction. You, you know, uh, we talked about this before, so just putting it out there for us to discuss at a later date. In addition to us being educated about the history and the character of this neighborhood, I think it's important for us to get out in the community and continue justifying why it's important that the HTC is a part of this neighborhood. Not only this one, but the other ones. It's something that we've talked about before. And I really think it's a good idea and one that we should actively pursue because there are people moving into 
historic districts all the time who don't a know it's a historic district and if they do then b they don't know why or how or or they don't know much about us and so i think we need to be educated constantly and so does the neighborhood Kim, you couldn't have set me up better for a couple of things that i'd like to talk about that aren't on our agenda um and if everyone's ready i can those? Okay. <laughs> so the next thing is, uh, speaking of education, is the, the preservation awards are back again this year. You will recall that they, they restarted last year after about a five year hiatus. And I am on the planning committee. Um, we are moving to an online awards ceremony because we don't think by August 20th, we're gonna have the ability to gather in large groups again, um, but there are some things underway that will hopefully make this fun and interactive. But I, want, I wanted to let the commission know that these are happening because one of the things that the, um, the committee's been asking me is what's going on in the historic districts that we can nominate? You know, how can we encourage some of the great projects that we know are happening in Charlotte and the historic neighborhoods, whether they are designated or not designated, um, for a preservation award and start with keep the education going. So think about it. Uh, I, I'm not going to put you on the spot right now, but send me an email if you think of some, and um, I will help reach out to the property owners and help coordinate that. But we're really excited about it. Uh, there is a new category this year preservation of small and medium community. And it's because um, we're not just Charlotte, uh, the Museum of History is the greater Charlotte area. And we found that last year, there were some really excellent submissions from Huntersville and other places around, but just couldn't compete with the Optimus Hall of Charlotte. So for example, the Huntersville Jail was a great project and something the community had worked really hard on for a long time, uh, but it couldn't compete with the scale of Optimus Hall. So the committee thought it was important to add this small and medium preservation project to recognize some of the good work going on um, outside of Char the city of Charlotte proper. Cool. I want to turn it over to Commissioner uh, Karate. To be Chairman Karate to talk about uh, really briefly about a project that her and her husband and the neighbors of Westlake Heights put together during um, the stay at home order and the shelter in place. Thank you. I uh, I live in Westlake Heights and one of our pretty active neighbors, uh, Kevin Jones, had this wonderful idea of doing a social distancing art club where we could showcase some of the many talented artists that we have in the neighborhood. And so it was on a Saturday morning uh, around nine. We had, as you can see here, visual artists um, show their, uh, their pieces. We had performing artists uh, out entertaining people. And then we had, um, I would say a culinary artist, uh, Hello, honey, people showing how their bees make the honey. And so it was really an exciting project. It's the first time it was, you know, uh, an idea born out of wanting to bring the community closer together and celebrate each other. Uh, because during the stay at home order, we're seeing our families and we're seeing our neighbors. And so why not? So I was really proud of people who stepped up and I was so excited about it. I decided to write a blog about it. And now, uh, as you see here, there's an artist, uh, Brandon Adams, who lives um, in a quadruplex in the neighborhood. And there's my personal fave, my husband, Tim, who, uh, who was showing off uh, his work and of course he's a professional artist a resident scenic artist at children's theater he also does work for some of the other performing arts organizations here 
but they were just two of a handful of people who stepped up and said, hey, this is who I am. This is what I'm about. Um, and uh, so if you're interested in checking out the article, go to SavvyKim.com. I talk about the houses, I talk about the people, and I talk about our community. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Chrissy. So I talked to Jessica Hyman, Commissioner Hyman, about uh, taking historic homes and making, making them fit a modern day lifestyle. I found that a lot of people in my particular neighborhood, when they come to this fork in the road where they're having children or maybe they're downsizing or they have some special need that uh, makes them want to either move or do something to their home, they're having to make a choice about what to do and, and, and um, how to do it. And so I spoke to Jessica Hyman at length about that. So she will be the subject of my next blog. And Jessica, I don't know if you can hear me, but uh, I just want to let you know, I just found uh, my other computer died. <laughs> and so I was very happy that I saved our interview to the cloud. So I just got it and I was able to listen to it last night and I'm really excited about uh, moving forward on the article. So that should be coming out in the next two or three weeks. Well, Kim, it was just really fun. It was really fun talking to you that day. So uh, I, lo I love what you're doing with this blog. I think it's, it's so cool. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I was really happy to have such an expert to weigh in on some of the things that I know people want to want address. library and the website is at the top it's charlottehistorytoolkit.com and it goes through it has headings on how to research newspapers cd directories plat maps he even has a small video um, with an example from oakland park of how to do this so you know if people ask you for resources this is we finally have something you can point people to in the city of charlotte so i was just thrilled I wanted to share this with all of you because I know that you do get approached from time to time about, hey, how do I find out more about my house? CharlotteHistoryToolkit.com. Yes, sir. And so you can actually go on there and, and look up your house and see the different property owners. And I don't know about that. It, it walks you through on what's a city directory, how to do this, where to look, where to find these resources in the library. Okay. It walks you through it. Yeah. What, you know, for most people, just don't even know where to start. And so this is sort of a starting place and explaining about all the different resources that are out there and where you might find information about your house. 20 years ago, I went down to the register of people. <laughs> yeah. I, I think we've evolved. Yeah. In some ways. Yeah. And the other thing, Tom, has been doing it as part of his role as the historian in residence is he has these five minute history series videos and the first one he put out was on oakland park and it's on the charlotte mecklenburg library's facebook page if you just go google charlotte mecklenburg library facebook and then you can watch any of the videos you do not have to be um, a member of Facebook, you do not have to sign up for an account, but I encourage you all to watch the one on the history of Oakland Park. It's excellent. And it's a shorter version of what he presented at our public meeting that we had um, in Oakland Park back in November. So it's really awesome. And then he also has put together some new walking tours on his um, History South website. So he has one specifically about the history of the Pleasant Midwood Historic District. And he put these up because he knew people were looking for things to do while they were having to stay at home. And 
uh, couldn't go on tours, he can't give them, and this is his way of getting all this information out so people can take advantage of it. These are the four that he's done so far, Elizabeth Noda, and then the Historic West End, Jason Itzview. Um, he also has linked to other walking tours that are out there, including, I believe he has a link to the Fourth Ward walking tour, and some that Center City Partners and Landmarks have put together, but these are the, the four that he has offered. Um, so just, you know, getting the information out there and letting you know that these exist. So um, you know, who knows when it might come in handy. And then we have one last thing. Uh, does anyone, before we uh, go to this last um, agenda item, does anyone have anything else they want to add or discuss or talk about? So lastly, we want to thank John Harris because John has been with us uh, for the past three years and he's been an invaluable member of this commission with his knowledge of history and architecture and the worth. And John, this is a picture of a certificate that you will be receiving. Um, we, we have a certificate and a small gift for you that we would like to do a, a more formal presentation when we can all get together. But I didn't want to let your last meeting go by without saying thank you. And, and just thank you for being such an advocate of preservation for the city of Charlotte and being such a support personally to me my role and to the commission. So just thank you so much. And, and thank you. And thank you. And, and thank you for you and all of the staff and all of the commission for, for what you do and, and how you do it with passion and with with uh, uh, desire to do it the right way. I mean, I, I, it's been a, uh, these past three years have gone by very quickly and uh, it's been my pleasure. It's been uh, my, um, I've really enjoyed this time, and I've been proud to be a part of this group. And uh, and I'll hopefully bring a few projects through every now and then, and uh, I won't be a stranger. Uh, and and I I implore you to uh, make me go by the guidelines, just like you would anyone else. <laughs> Keep me honest. But thanks thanks for everything as well. Thank you, John. Thank you so much. And I'm sorry we couldn't do no, something no more. Problem. This, 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 that's just saying that's very nice. I appreciate we'll, it. We'll have you come back and do something Please. more in person. I, I mean, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, anybody, is there anything else for the good of the order? Uh, that's... Um, this is Damon. I just want to say a quick something. Yes, sir. Um, Jim, thank you for handling, uh, chairing this uh, commission for the, I think it's three years or so. That you've done it, you've done a great job, and uh, thank you. Yes, thank you. here, here. Thank you. Yes. Now I get to make motion. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm sure you'll expect me to. Yeah. <laughs> what goes around comes around. Yeah, I knew I was going to hear from you, buddy. <laughs> Three years yeah. <laughs> well, um, as you know, the situation with COVID is fluid, and we are waiting to hear from the governor when phase three will start. Uh, phase two it currently is scheduled to go through Friday, June 26th, and I hope we learn before then that we can gather in groups greater than 10, uh, just in time for our July 8th meeting. So. Um, we hope that until then, everyone stays well and um, just keeps up the good work and continues to be advocates for preservation. So thank you. Chrissy, to that point, do we have a big queue like of projects waiting for us? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, what did you say, Jim? Yeah. Uh, just curious, do we have a big queue of projects that are waiting for us to do a review of? Yeah. Yes, we do. <laughs> yes, we have, um, we probably have 35 or 40 projects. Um, however, they are broken up into different meetings. I will probably be asking the commission to hold a, a special cold meeting or two 
ideally, I would like to hold two meetings in July to try and get us caught back up. Um, there is a chance that we, we may be able to, we, we did not have a ton of applications for June or July. Um, but of course, agendas always depend on continuances and getting through the preceding agendas. So I don't know if we can do this in three meetings or if we are going to need more to get caught back up. And, and that's including regular meetings. So our next regular meeting is July 8th. And then my hope is we can have a cold meeting at the end of July. But then again, that also depends on the availability of meeting rooms like this that we can space out. Any other questions? Christy, this is Jessica. If we go to four meetings, how does the RNC potentially affect that? How does what? The RNC in August. If we go to a fourth meeting uh, end of August. I forgot about that. Well, I don't know that it's being held here, is it? Yeah, the previous part. As of this morning, they were saying Jacksonville, but. Okay. Jacksonville, you know. the nomination speech and all that stuff. Okay. Business part of the. Well, I, all of this to say is um, I am looking at every possible scenario and nothing set in stone. Um, you know, for all we know, the governor could not come out on the 26th and say, you know what, no, we're extending the safer at home, no more than 10 people gathering. And then we kind of figure out a way around that. So I'm looking looking at options if he does that. I'm looking at options if he lets us gather in groups of 25. Um, but I think your RNC is well, it's well received and well taken. And thank you. Okay. Okay. We've reached the end of the agenda. Is there anyone else want to discuss any other business? Here you know, the meeting is adjourned at 45. Good job. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.